Meets CAD podcast serves as another conduit between academia and the meat industry through conversations with talented and brilliant meat scientists. These discussions help foster and improve communication and knowledge dissemination within the meat science community. Hello, meat folks. Welcome to the Meat Spot podcast. My name is Francisco Nahara. I'm your host today. We have a very special episode today. Um, we have uh, a very good friend that accepting the invitation to be on this podcast today. Uh, it, is, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dave Gerard. He is a professor and department head of the uh, Department of Animal and Poultry Science at Virginia Tech. Thank you, Dr. Gerard, for accepting the invitation. How are you today? Good, Francisco, and, and it's great to see you uh, during this pandemic. I hope yeah. everything's uh, Everything's nice at K-State. Absolutely, absolutely. But well, we have a, a very special episode. We'll talk, uh, we'll talk about um, some of the factors that really impact meat quality from a more technical standpoint, but we'll, we'll try to put it in a very um, a layman's terms for our audience to understand more when, when they're, um, when we have, uh, a meat processor that really are listening to this um, podcast and they may be wondering, they've been cutting meat for uh, so many years. And we started talking about some of the difference between muscles and biochemically that really gets that organoleptic characteristics. And I think we'll, we'll touch on, on, on some of those factors, fiber type, um, some of the difference between red meat and white meat. So that's, it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, but before we, uh, start off this conversation, Dr. Gerard, please. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, about your career. Um, who is Dr. Gerard? Well, I'd love to. You know, I was born in uh, northern Indiana, uh, just a farm boy. And uh, I went to Purdue University and studied. And my educational uh, pedigree looks like a telephone pole because I got all three degrees at Purdue University. And I left there and I went to the University of Missouri, a fine place, then refer returned to Purdue University and uh, tried to assemble a pretty good meat science program there and then uh, left to become the department head at Virginia Tech. Uh, we still uh, have a pretty large research program and we currently have about six PhDs in our, in our program here. Uh, it's a federally funded program and Francisco, as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's a pretty fundamental program, but I think uh, we can explain some of these fundamental programs and the application of those uh, studies uh, to the application of meat quality and animal growth and, and development. So that's kind of where I am, my friend. Yeah, and I think you're, you've been very humble um, when we talk about yourself. I know uh, we had some conversations you've been to France uh, for um, some time. That's, that could be considered your second language, third language, French? Well, I, uh, I don't know. I can order a beer in, in <laughs> French. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like to think I've spent as much uh, time in the Southern Hemisphere in uh, South America. That's, that's really an amazing, that's an amazing continent. And um, we really look towards helping them as we try to feed the 9 billion people in the world in 2050, because there's a lot of capacity there. And we, we really enjoy working with those folks about developing their uh, agriculture. Which, which countries are being at in South America? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Brazil quite a bit. I work with those folks uh, pretty extensively. Uh, just visited Argentina last fall. And then, of course, I was a Fulbright scholar in uh, Uruguay. Uh, and so we've got some friends there. Just a, it's a great, really just a great, uh, great place. Yeah, I mean, and I, I think one of the, the, the most important things that we're missing today is like, uh, I met you before we met in person. Uh, there is a famous book, The Principles of Meat Science, that Dr. Art is a co-author. And I think I, um, so you're pretty famous, so. <laughs> I'm probably famous for a lot more than I'd like to get into on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, about meat science. Um, I know we 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 have some content to go over, but 
um, just, I guess, to start this conversation, please tell us a, a little bit about your work. What does, I mean, what's the your work um, has been related to so some of the biochemical factors that, that play a role in me that has an impact on, on, on other characteristics like tenderness, color, but tell us, tell us more about from your experience. What do you think when, when I mean, when we talk about big quality from your perspective, please, please tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, so I, my PhD was actually in bovine myogenesis and I studied double muscling. And after I got done at Purdue and of course all three educations at Purdue and being only 50 miles from the home farm, I really needed to uh, snap the umbilical cord for lack of a better term. And so I reached out to some labs in Europe to study uh, myogenesis because at that time it was pretty hard to get double muscle cattle. And so I finally um, went, I got an invitation to go to uh, a French lab, uh, Institution Nationale de Recherche Agronomique, which is a comparison to the USDA uh, labs that we have in the United States. And when I was there uh, and working on a study, they did a lot of what's called fiber typing. And fiber typing is essentially slicing the muscle really, um, really thinly and then identifying each cell, right? And whether it has what kind of energy metabolism, whether it uses glucose predominantly or whether it uses fat. And the proteins that are associated with those cells are really fascinating because when you look at a picture of cross section of muscle, it's absolutely uh, impressive because there's, there's just different cell types there and they stain differently. And it's, it's really quite um, intriguing when you look at it. And I came to realize that that really, ha really meant that all muscle is not the same. We often just grab a piece of meat and we say the meat from this part of the animal is the same as from a different part. And that's, it's actually not true at all. In fact, muscle is a collection of, of different cell types that metabolize energy differently and they contract at different speeds. So for example, if you take uh, chicken breast, for example, uh, it, it is predominantly white muscle, right? And you can tell that from the color of it because uh, it doesn't have any pigment, right? Any pigment, the major pigment being myoglobin, which is similar to hemoglobin, which is red the, that you see in blood. And so it doesn't have a lot of pigment in that tissue as compare that to the thigh of a chicken. Um, and, and the thigh has a lot more uh, pigment in it and consequently it functions differently. Well, the same can be said for beef, right? It's just the magnitude of the difference is not that great between uh, muscles in the round or muscles in the longus and the dorsi. There is some variation in pork, though, if you look at the ham muscles, and oftentimes uh, those muscles that are lighter are, are superficial on the ham on the outside, um, and those closer to the bone are more red and of course they're more red because they work more often right so they stabilize the joint when the pig's standing uh, when the pig walks around he uses those muscles that stabilize it in the same way in humans the muscles around our spinal spinal column are more red and more fatigue resistant right and when we say fatigue resistant it means they can work better i always use this example in class if anyone's ever picked up a chicken, I said, what does a chicken do? And the chicken beats the tar out of you with its wings for about two seconds. And then it just, the wings flop back and it says, eat me, right? It's because they're fatigable. So the breast muscle is very fatigable. If you compare that to the thighs, the thighs still work. But even compare that to uh, duck breast, right? Duck breast is, is red meat as is uh, goose uh, breast meat, because it's, it's fatigue resistant, because those are migratory birds and they have to use those breast muscles to fly long distances and, and become, uh, and they're, so they're fatigue resistant. 
So this whole idea that that the type of muscle is related to quality, um, I think is, is emerging in the literature. I have some students that have graduated and gone to different uh, universities and are uh, running research programs. And certainly the energy metabolism uh, that's used in those individual fibers uh, can affect tenderness, can affect protease uh, abilities, in fact, uh, Dr. Scheffler at the University of Florida has noticed uh, that the uh, zebu cattle um, regulate energy differently uh, because of the energy metabolism that occurs in some of that muscle. Wow. And likewise, you know, Solomon Matarne at, at Utah State, another uh, one of my uh, good students, has just shown that the type of myosin and when I say myosin, that's a predominant muscle protein that makes uh, cells work, is different uh, in cattle that are more tender. So, so I think the data is emerging, especially in the beef, uh, that, there's, that there's, it's related to tenderness and ultimate uh, eating quality of beef. Hey, no, I think this is, this is pretty interesting and, and really helps to... I mean, just to lay out some of the conversation that we'll have here in, in a couple of more minutes, but you mentioned pretty importantly, red fibers. And uh, it's been well established that red fibers tend to have a little bit more fat. And we'll start talking about white fibers and red fibers. And so when we talk about sensory, what, how, what does that mean for the meat industry or meat processors? Like they trying to digest this information. Um, would you please t help us a little bit on that? Well, the, the, you have to be a little bit careful. Um, you have to be a little bit careful because red muscle general, generally oxidizes fat or utilizes fat more readily. Um, there's, there's fat within the cell, which is intracellular fat. Then there's marbling as we know it which is deposited between uh, the cells, right? Um, as intramuscular fat. Um, that's a different kind of a scenario because in one case, the lipids in the cells because the cells metab metabolize it. In another case where animals are, are overfed for lack of a better term, uh, they begin to deposit that wherever they can in the muscle as, as, as um, intramuscular fat or marbling. So one of them, it, it's a little bit of a different scenario where one's depositing fat within the totality of the musculature because of overnutrition. And the other way is the red muscle because that's the energy that it uses, deposits it in the cell. Uh, but it certainly does have a different organoleptic flavor because remember, uh, these cells in red muscle are smaller, which means they have more surface area, which means they probably have more phospholipids or the, the, the flavor compounds that are in the cell membranes, right? Uh, so it's, all, it's, it's quite a complex uh, set of issues that go into uh, sensory attributes of, of meat. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the main reasons we... I uh, wanted to talk to you about because you are one of the of the uh, researchers and professors that really have um, heavily researched this area, and I think you're the best person to talk to about this 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 topic. I've been reading one of your last uh, more most recent uh, paper as a review by by Weeks, uh, and other and you're the co-author uh, in that. Um, and you have a very good uh, explanation of why is that grain-fed cattle have a, may, may have a different organoleptic uh, properties that are more like grass-fed or the cattle have been fed with uh, forage. Or, will you please tell us a little bit more about that, if, if you will? Yeah, that's really a good topic here in the last, I would say in the last three years is when we really uh, been putting a little effort into it. And it's really funny because we were just talking about um, South America or the Southern Hemisphere. 
And the individual that got our lab switched uh, away or to include beef color was um, a Chilean visiting scientist. And he's the primary author on that paper. And he came up to me after I talked at the uh, International uh, Congress of Meat Science and Technology. And of course he spoke Spanish, but he was speaking to me in English, albeit it was more like Spanglish. And he said, ah, oh, Dr. Gerard, I, I've got to come work in your lab. Uh, and I didn't understand about half of it, but I, I love folks from different countries. I think it brings a lot of diversity to the program. And I go, sure, what do you want to study? He said, I want to study beef quality. And I go, I don't know anything about beef quality or beef color, excuse me. And so I think if, the, if numbers are right, it's, it's like a billion dollar loss, just the color of, of beef. I, I don't hold me to those numbers, but it's a, a pretty large number. And so we started to talk about it. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, they feed lots. Of, it's forage-based feeding. It's not, we, you know this better than I do, Francisco, right? And so, um, of course, you always blame dark beef on, on um, stress or age or genetics or what else? affects it. But I don't think anybody thinks about what, how they're fed. And so in a paper that we worked with, with Susan Duckett, another, another uh, outstanding uh, meat scientist from Clemson, she spent studying organoleptic product or properties of grass and grain fed beef for years. Outstanding scientist. Anyway, I called her and, you know, I've got this visiting scientist in my lab. I got to have samples to do something. We work in pork, right? Or that's where we started working. And I said, Susan, do you have any samples? And so I told uh, Ariel and I were talking one day and I said, man, the way you manage these cattle has to have an effect on the color. I said, it, it's not, it's not all dark cutting as we know it, because dark cutting is a stress related phenomena where you don't have any energy in the muscle and the pH that never go down, right? right? So she sent us a, a bunch of samples and, and we ran the myoglobin content, which is a major pigment, right? As you, as you know, and, and these cattle that were grass fed had a significant amount of myoglobin, more myoglobin in them. So if you got more myoglobin, you got a darker red, right? Now, I think one of the emeriti there at, uh, K-State might argue a little bit about that, um, but the fact of the matter is my globin concentration does change uh, between livestock, um, and these pHs were the, the ultimate pH of the meat was, was the same, but the my globin concentration was higher, so it argues that uh, grass-fed beef is a little darker. We have a study with our colleagues in Brazil. They've done nearly the exact same thing, probably a little bit more detailed, and they have, they've gotten the same results, right? And, and their study was a little bit better designed because they did grass and grain, but then they did grass and grain at the same growth rate. So you could, you could look at, well, is it just the forage or is it the growth rate? And um, Salo de Silva, which you may know at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, they've got data that support that study. So there's little, I think there's little question that while dark cutting is still an issue, in other words, if you stress an animal and they go dark, that's truly the case, but it's not the only way to get dark beef. Um, yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I thank you for that. Thank you for sharing. Uh, this is pretty valuable, but uh, I guess I'll follow up on that, and I think just to make it more into context to our meat processors, so you mentioned uh, typically more um, higher concentration of myoglobin in grass-fed cattle. Um, in terms of color, and more specifically for those folks that have their own um, slaughter facility, they kill, they also have their little shop where they will display their meat, would you expect some discoloration differences between 
I mean, since having higher concentration myoglobin compared to to the other to, to the counterpart, would you expect uh, discoloration one discolor faster than the other one? Yeah, you probably know that. <laughs> you probably know that data better than I do. So if I mess this up, make sure you correct me. Yeah. But I can edit it or something and we'll make sure yeah, no worries. <laughs> yeah, don't make me sound like a knucklehead. But you know, that's the interesting thing I've, I've told some people. And I'm, I'll give you more information than you asked, but I, ultimately I'll try to answer your question. That's a little bit of an issue with locally produced um, livestock because sometimes it's, it's locally produced, which meant um, it's not lower quality, but it's lower input. And generally, when you're feeding cattle and you want to sell it to a small locker, right, you, you want to make sure, you, you want to make as much money as possible because the margins aren't very high. Well, the biggest cost is the amount of feed you put in it. So oftentimes, when people sell freezer beef, now this may not be the case where you're located now, but certainly in other parts of the country, you know, they'll put them out on grass and they won't get a lot of grain or they'll get you know, maybe a few pounds of grain. And they'll say, oh, no, they were grain finished. Well, the whole idea of the U.S. grading system back in the day was to make sure uh, that cattle were on feed for a while because it ensured tenderness, right? It ensured flavor, right? We know, we know that. That's very well established. But the other problem with this is, is oftentimes if you don't feed these cattle, um, then they don't uh, they don't brighten up very much because there's about two points different in the L star value and two points on an L star value that's probably a little bit too much science but that's an objective way to measure color um, is noticeable by the human eye so oftentimes when you go to some of these local markets uh, you see some beef that's been fed locally it's pretty dark it's not what we normally associate with cherry red beef that we find in the in the uh, markets so i think you have i think if you're if you're selling freezer beef and you want to make sure that you get a high quality uh, product they really need to have been on feed for a while otherwise you're going to get some organoleptic grass fed nest and it's okay if that's what you like i mean in some yeah. countries they prefer that in uruguay the yeah. stronger the stronger the flavor the better right yeah brazil argentina all those places yeah i mean it, and and the cookery method is for that but i think for for most americans um that's a pretty strong flavor right yeah. and the other thing is is you got to get them you got to get them on feed for a while and i don't know what that number is in fact folks in the hallways there at k-state could probably tell you but you know short fed cattle that's probably good enough right uh, but, you know, we're used to 150 days on feed in some cases, right? Thank you. Uh, I think um, this is just pretty, pretty valuable information for our, our folks that are listening. Um, have, so I, I guess before we started recording this, we had a, a little conversation on, you know, we always refer to as I mean, within the carcass, we talk about just beef or pork, within the carcass, um, towards the either the interior of the, of the carcass or the posterior of the carcass, you will tend to have some tenderness differences even within the carcass. Um, we oftentimes say, generally speaking, that uh, muscles of locomotion, as you mentioned at the very uh, beginning of, the, of, the, of this episode, they tend to have red fibers because they, they, the animal uses it a lot to move. Um, but then we know that even within the shoulder, we have some muscles that are tender than others. Would you please uh, explain to us more about that in terms of, um, so biochemically, what, what's going on that we see that those differences, even within, within the, the, the chalk, the, the shoulder of, 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 of the animal, we see that those differences between, between muscles in terms of tenderness, and I guess going back to, you mentioned the, into the fiber type, if that's, that's a case, how, how can we help to explain that? Just going back to the example, 
not all the muscles from the chuck are um, tough. You know, you got those muscles, uh, that petite tendon and all that. Like, is it is it that related to, to a fiber type or not so much? You know, I uh, honestly, Francisco, I, I doubt it in that case. You know, and I've given this a lot of thought. You know, I'm old enough now. I've thought about these things long enough. And you always think of the angles on everything. Well, one of the, you know, one, so when you talk about tenderness, there, there's, there's really the muscle protein overlap, right? That's how much protein overlaps. Um, and, and what's the best example of that would be some of the, uh, some things that happen. So if pre-rigor, if you pull a muscle off a, a carcass and it shortens, right, it's allowed to shorten and you make stakes out of that, it's, it's going to be tough because the muscle contracted, you interact more proteins together, it's a denser product, it's tough. So that's, that's one way uh, to do it. The other is the connective tissue element, right? And some muscles have more connective tissue than others. For example, in the shoulder, as you pointed out, there's more connective tissue in many of those muscles. But at the same time, if the muscle isn't responsible for doing a whole lot, it doesn't need a lot of connective tissue. And an example of that would be uh, the psoas, right? The psoas um, flexes. The, ten the tenderloin? For yes, the tenderloin, that might, yeah. Yeah. Yep, the, the, the tenderloin muscle. It flexes the hip and cattle don't flex their hips a lot. So it, it it's, doesn't have a lot of connective tissue. And then the final thing is is really this whole protease thing, or how how enzymes within the meat tend to degrade them, you know. And we can we age meat, which is a controlled rotting of meat, for lack of a better term. Um, those are not always the same from muscle to muscle, and certainly that could be related to fiber type. And I think there's some emerging data that that suggests that. Again, out of the Utah State Lab, Dr. Matarne, um, and also um, uh, Dr. Scheffler at the University of Florida. And uh, the energy metabolism, which is fiber type, is related to that. So it's entirely possible. I don't know for sure. I don't know of any data like that. But then you've got temperature issues and how the, how the muscles are stretched on the carcass. And that, that all has a profound impact on muscle to muscle variation. Good. I think we're coming almost to the end of this episode. It's very, it, this is a lot of information. And I hope, I hope that everyone, um, it's, this is, this is, I mean, this is a lot of information, but at the same time, it's, it's in, on layman's terms so that everyone can understand it. I think one of the most, important questions that I've been getting from, from processors maybe uh, and, I, and I, I had a conversation with some folks uh, in northeastern Mexico uh, almost three weeks ago. They, they, as you mentioned, there are some different genetics and uh, we tend to have more Cebu cattle than you. I mean, here, especially in the Midwest, you won't find that type of cattle. In Mexico, we, we are starting to have a better quality system when it comes to um, like compared to the U.S. that we know that a lot of or a lot of the cattle that it's slaughtered in the U.S. less than 30 months of age. That then that's and with tender is one is one thing. I mean we, we know that we get the more tender product, but um, in terms of fiber types and all that, does that has an impact? I mean age has an impact on fiber types. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing I wanted to point out is th these are changing over time, right? So they tend to change over time. There's a French scientist that, uh, that showed um, these more glycolytic fibers tend to increase as a percentage uh, with time. So they, they change over time. To give you the best uh, advice on, on growing cattle and what weight, I think it depends a little bit on the mature size of the animal, for one. You know, the, some of them weigh 1,300 pounds, some of them weigh 1,000 pounds, and they're done. I think, relatively speaking, the most efficient thing to do is 
grow them fast and grow them hard because that makes them as young as possible uh, with as much groceries in them. And at least, at least in North America, or more importantly, not more importantly, excuse me, Francisco, um, at least uh, germane to the United States that's used to fed cattle, you know, get them there as fast as possible. The difference though, the difference in, in, in probably in Mexico and in South America for sure, there's a little bit of a, you gotta get, you gotta get the most efficiency out of them. So if you slaughtered cattle, let's say Nalore cattle from Brazil or eared cattle somewhere, if you slaughter them too young, you don't, you don't harvest as much forage that way, right? Which means you don't make as much money. But that's why, that's why I, I think it's fascinating to know the management uh, strategies for different countries in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere are, are really quite different. And the economic outputs are different too. We can wrap it up uh, with a, a little bit of a the historic, historically, you mentioned like 20 years ago, you, you put that, um, you were writing this article or this chapter, this, was it a book? Was it a, uh, when you mentioned about the pig and the collar and that, is this where we're going? So I, oh, I, oh yeah, I, the pork. Yeah. If you let me think, was it pork? There's a magazine called Pork, right? Yeah. And it was pork. I think it was pork 97. So, you okay. know. All right. So I, I, That's I guess a long it, time ago. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but I guess historically, um, will you will you tell us like what was your perspective twenty years ago um, on where we're going? What you and what just what's your perspective now that what you envision that that was going to happen? And now, what do you think is going to going to happen in twenty in twenty more years? Do you think so? Would you? I think we, that could be a wrap up well i'm not sure that i'm the best person to tell you where the meat industry is going in 20 years i think there's a lot better um, folks probably in your part of the world that could tell you that i've seen them change a lot i've seen the production practices change a lot i mean it, and it's I don't think it's a big secret. The pork industry is completely vertically integrated. They were talking about that when I was in school and that was going to change. I think that'll continue to uh, change. I think you'll still see some, some creep on, on the size of, of pigs because of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the indirects, uh, you, you decrease your indirects on, on, on a weight basis. Uh, so I think that's going to continue to occur. Um, I think we might rethink this whole uh, cooling rate. I think that was a way to quick fix um, PSE, the occurrence of PSE. And I'm kind of wondering if we kind of went a little overboard on that. I also think that processing, we've got these lines so fast. Some of these processing lines are so fast. I mean, the idea is, what do you tell your packer? Get them dead and get them in the cooler as fast as possible. And I wonder, remember, we're dealing with a living tissue that's really sensitive uh, to a lot of these things that happen to it. And I wonder if we haven't over, over sped them into the cooler. And some of our, our current data, we've got some data um, that suggests that might be the case, at least in pigs. Um, but I don't know that I've got a crystal ball, Francisco. I, I, I think the I think the research that's going on, certainly the meat-based research, is going to continue to revolve around uh, shelf stability, at least on the fresh side. Process side is going to be, you know, more organic stuff. Um, and then I think on the on the basic fundamental side, it's it's going to be data driven uh, kind of stuff. You know uh, well about that. Yeah. Sensors, whatever whatever sensors we can use to monitor growth. Yeah, to go get uh, get more information out of them that we can utilize to make 
um, make big make decisions. Like they they're gonna have an impact on the economics and especially with that company and and absolutely in the future because that might that may also drive prices down if we make it more efficiently. Uh, but thank, I mean, I guess this is this is this was great. This was awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gerard, for for being here. I think this is a lot of information that I hope our our audience um, benefit from. Uh, and make sure if you you have any questions on something, please let me know. Um, I will I will get them. I'll respond them. If I cannot respond them, I'll I'm sure I'll, I'll get them to Dr. Gerard and, and see what, how can we help you to to just uh, improve and, and just move, move forward with, with, with everything, right? With this COVID-19 that hit us and, and still, it still is here. So it's not, it's, it's not going anywhere. So well, thank you again. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you enough for, for having the opportunity. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thanks. We want to thank our sponsors for the leadership and support. 